Okay. Go ahead, Ashley, take it away. And then I would, could everyone, um, well, welcome. It's good to see everybody. Yes. Um, and would everyone mind putting their, um, their name and just, you know, your organization or your connection to the Safe Sleep, Ta Safe Sleep Task Force in the, um, in the chat just for our records? That would be awesome. No worries, Angela. We see that you're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a great photo, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you, everybody, um, for joining today. Um, yeah, I'm excited for this month's Safe Sleep Task Force meeting. Um, do you want, we can just do maybe like pretty quick introductions, like kind of just, you know, kind of what you're typing in the chat, just say your name and your connection to the Safe Sleep Task Force, just because we have a few um, uh, people that haven't been on in a while or maybe some new faces. So um, I'm Ashley Gadway. I'm the Safe Sleep Coordinator at, Safe Sleep Coordinator at Washington Area Council for Children. And um, yeah, I've been working here since about August and took over for Althea Wilson. And so still learning the ropes and um, yeah, really grateful to everyone for being so uh, welcoming and supportive along the way. Do you wanna pass off to somebody? Should we do it that way? Sure, yeah, that, that works. Um, go and pick somebody. Um, maybe Michelle, you can go next. Uh, Michelle Walters, Executive Director at WACC. Um, love seeing all of you here today. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, for some of you, this may have been like your 10th meeting today, which is my case. So I apologize if I'm blurry eyed and <laughs> not coherent, but um, I'm really excited about some of our discussions that we, we have in this group. So thank you for being here. Um, and I will pick uh, Catherine. Hi there, I'm Catherine Chang. I'm one of the pediatric hospitalists at Mott Hospital and um, I'm basically here for the pediatric medical perspective. Oh, I forgot, I was supposed to pick somebody. Um, Mackenzie. Hey, I'm Mackenzie. I'm uh, an MSW intern at the VACC and I'm taking notes, but I've been doing this for a minute. And um, Kathy. Um, I'm Kathy Wyatt. I work for our Sheriff Jerry Clayton. Um, and I'm here because it's important. Because having healthy mothers and healthy babies um, is about as rich cause as you can get in a lot of ways. And I think we all should. Um, where we can, we should. And I think we can all make a difference if we work together. And Margie. Thanks, Kathy. I'm Margie Long and I'm with Success by Six, Great Start Collaborative. Yeah. And one of our um, key outcomes that we're striving for is to be sure that children are born healthy and uh, developmentally on track. Um, and so that's why I'm here. And I'll pick Helen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Helen Joa, and I'm the project manager for the Region 9 Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Um, Obviously, Washtenaw County is part of Region 9, so that's part of the reason I'm here. Um, and also just really interested in the work you all are doing with reducing disparities um, in maternal health outcomes and just trying to figure out how we can use the collaborative network to help support this work. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it over to April. Hi, everyone. Um, I think this is actually my first safe sleep meeting. I've been invited for a while. Um, and I know I've, I've asked multiple times to have someone else take over in this role from the HHS, but I know, I don't, I don't think that's really happened since uh, Cassie Pryor left her position. So um, hopefully at some point, I think that they're gonna be starting to um, disperse some meetings and some collaborative um, things to other people across CPS, because I think it's very important for CPS to have, um, you know, a place here. 
Um, and not that I don't deal with safe sleep because I do guardianships and prevention. So that is very important, but um, yeah. And who else is left? Carolyn, I think. Sure. Thank you, April. I'm Carolyn Graves. I'm with Child Care Network, the Great Start to Quality Southeast Resource Center. And we support infants and toddlers as part of our mission, as part of uh, educators and being interested in seeing healthy and successful adults because infanthood is where that all begins. Um, and I will pass it on to Angela. Yes, hi. Good afternoon. My apologies again. Something is wrong with the video. This is, it's the first in a long time. Uh, but um, Angela, I'm Jangela Johnson. I'm with Michigan Medicine in two areas, two units. I'm with the Department of Community Health Services Program for Multicultural Health, which uh, is the community-faced unit of the health system. Um, develop, design, execute community engaged activities, health education, health promotion, community health research, um, and the other unit, Zero to Thrive, which is a research intervention unit from the Department of Psychiatry at Michigan Medicine. And I serve as director of uh, community engagement and equity, as well as I uh, head up some of our research or clinical protocols there. And previously on the board of directors for Washtenaw Area Council for Children. So that's, I think that's my connection to Safe Sleep. I've been a part of the Safe Sleep team when, way back from when there used to be, and I'm not sure if it still exists, the Infant Mortality Reduction Team, which I think it's the predecessor to Safe Sleep, um, more focused on from a retrospective um, vantage point on. Um, infant mortality, sort of, af uh, I want to say after the fact, but trying to do some of the preconception um, preventative care initiatives that would help prevent some of the infant mortality. I think we've got Martha Kelly. I suppose it, yes. Hi, Martha. I think Martha and is just. Carol are left. Yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, Martha. Hello. My, my video isn't working either. I couldn't even get onto this link. So thank you for whoever sent it to me. Apologies. Uh, so I'm Martha Kerman with the Child Protection Team at Michigan Medicine. Carol, would you like to go next? Hi, my name is Carol Hittinger. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a parent volunteer with Washington Air Council for Children. And I'm also on um, a, a safe, safe sleep task force committee for the state. Um, I lost a child due to unsafe sleep conditions. So that's why I'm here to help share his story and just be a part of making things better for everybody. And Kelly. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Carr and I work for the Washtenaw County Health Department as a maternal child health epidemiologist. I've been sitting on the Safe Sleep Task Force for a couple of years now um, and kind of report back on like potential infant mortality cases associated with safe sleep as well as provide some data and insight um, just for other, other top, uh, topics and tasks uh, that the Safe Sleep Task Force um, is involved with. And I apologize for my video too. It's, it's my computer is the one that's doing this in and out, but uh, I don't, yeah, it's, it's just not working right now. Thanks everyone. Thank you. And I think someone is on their iPad, but I didn't see who it was. Has, does anybody know who's on their iPad or if it's one of you that's just got two things open? Does anybody know who's Hello. on their iPad? Hi. Hi, can you hear us okay? Oh, shoot, thirdly, okay. and I see a bunch of beautiful women. I am so sorry that I cannot figure out how to put my name in there, which is Tawana Parker of Destiny and Purpose Community Outreach. <laughs> I have Hi, two Tawana. IPads. Hi, everybody. The <laughs> other iPad has my name on it. So <laughs> this one awesome. doesn't, but I'm listening in. 
It looks like I can rename you. Tawana, how do you spell your name? T-O-W-A-N-A. Wonderful. Wow. There you go. Look at that. There you go. It's great to have you here. And I wish we could see right. you. It's been Hi, a while. Ashley. Hello, Ashley. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I'm so glad you're able to join. Yes, I am yeah. too. This is great. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm excited to start diving in here. Um, so the first thing we have here on the meeting agenda um, is WACC's Pancakes for Prevention Breakfast. It's on April 28th. It's early. Um, it's just from 8 to 9 a.m. And um, yeah, do you want to kind of explain it a little bit as well, um, Michelle? That'd be great. Sure, absolutely. Um, so every year we do a breakfast as a community outreach to our community partners. So all of you are obviously invited to this uh, wonderful breakfast that we've had. Um, we had been doing it the last two years virtually. We are going to do it in person and we will have a live streaming option for people who cannot attend in person. Um, it is free. Uh, we have a speaker, guest speaker, Rogerio Pinto. He's a professor at U of M and um, is going to speak about his project around grief and loss and uh, the abuse that he has endured in his life and how that connects to the importance and value behind the prevention work that we do. Um, he's a very dynamic speaker. He's very engaging. And I'm really looking forward to having him present to us and talk with the group and really challenge our thinking about how we can engage as a community um, into the prevention world. So um, please attend if you can. I think he'll be uh, worth, worth the hour. It starts at eight o'clock. Um, we have, like I said, we've got breakfast available for you, and then it'll be at the Ann Arbor City Club over on Washtenaw Avenue. So um, let us know if you're going to be able to be there, or let us know if you would like the link to be able to uh, log in online. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, one thing that I also wanted to touch on that I did not put in the agenda is that um, we are applying to a, the, a grant over at Speckard Knight. Um, just for our safe sleep program in general to help fund pack and place and um, just kind of operations of this safe baby program here. And um, we're just looking for a few letters of support. So if anybody is willing to um, write something, if you could have it by next Friday the 18th, that would be amazing. I have a template that I can send over to you. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions or want to hear more about the program and the grant that we're applying for, I'd also love to meet with you and talk with you about that as well. Um, so if you have any interest in that, you can shoot me an email, write it in the chat, you know, let me know whenever, um, that would be awesome. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, and then Helen, I wanted to check and see if you had any updates on the trauma informed toolkit that you've been working on and getting um, feedback from. Yeah, I can provide um, a quick update for you all. So um, thank you. I know some members from this group actually participated in that feedback process. So thank you very much. Um, we were able to collect feedback from, I think it was six or, yeah, six obstetric care providers um, and received really phenomenal feedback. Um, definitely going back and making some revisions and um, fixing and adding to, you know, kind of, um, enhancing some of the materials that we have right now with that feedback, um, but really an overall really positive response. Um, a lot of comments indicating interest in wanting to use and implement the toolkits once they're fully up and running. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to really fill in a gap, a gap in services that's happening really across the entire region. And so the toolkits aim to make sure that all staff, you know, the front desk staff all the way to the providers are trained to utilize a trauma-informed approach to care. And then we provide some additional recommendations for universal education and screening, since you can't tell who's experienced trauma just by looking at them, um, as well as some right care planning options and uh, um, other trauma interventions that are available in the area. So we'll continue working on developing those. Um, our next steps include actually sharing the patient facing materials with um, community members in a focus group setting and really testing to see, you know, if this tool was used, how would that change your care experience and trying to get that feedback. 
Um, so once I have more details there, if there's anyone that you think would be really phenomenal in offering that feedback, um, please let me know and I'll, I'll be sure to pass along the flyer once we have it. We're just not quite there yet. Um, and yeah, I'll keep, keep everyone in the loop there, but really thank you all so much for the support. Um, yeah, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the chat or you can reach out to me afterwards, but I don't want to take up too much time from the rest of Ashley's agenda and the other work happening. I would just like to echo how appreciative our team is because I serve on the team that kind of helped put some of this stuff together, but just how appreciative we are of the feedback because it really does help us think differently about what the approach was or what the intent was. So thank you. I just put it in the chat, but I just wanted to confirm, like this is an obstetric or OBGYN focused, is that like a maternal health focused yes. trauma-informed care? Okay. Yes. Um, I was just asking because, you know, Mott Hospital also has an effort towards developing some trauma-informed, I don't know exactly what we're calling it right now, but <clears throat> I'm not on that particular committee, um, yeah. but it was just... Checking. Yeah, thank you. And I will I will check that out more. Um, and yes, all the materials really are focused on obstetric care providers. Yeah, thank you so much, Helen. And yeah, thank you everyone who's um, participated in that and given feedback. That's really, um, yeah, that's so helpful. So thank you for the update, Helen. Um, so yeah, I really wanted to, to jump back into our um, conversations regarding um, racial maternal health disparities, especially in Washtenaw County and just generally and what um, what we're doing and what we can be doing and just where the, um, you know, where the gaps are, where the, where, um, where we can be jumping in and what we can be doing. So um, yeah, I wrote in here, you know, diversifying doula care. So that's something else Helen's group has been working on is um, a, a grant to um, help on board and train a more diverse clientele of doulas for um, the entire region as well to provide that care. And, um, and I know we had talked before about, you know, the seeing, um, yeah, a more, uh, the maternal health disparities more so in the 4897-48198 area code. And I just wanted to kind of talk more about that and see if anyone had, um, yeah, anything to kind of jump off that. I think um, I'd like to invite Margie to even talk a little bit about what the um, adequate prenatal care group had been doing as well, because I feel like there are a couple of good pockets that are really trying to work together to kind of move some of this stuff forward. And then um, I also kind of want to put out to the group, um, like, I don't have my folder with me, but I wanted to think back about what we were discussing, you know, last summer about um, increasing that access to care, thinking about how providers look and, and are from the areas and the communities in which, and the populations in, of which are being served, um, how, what is the impact or the work that this group could be doing to help influence that? Um, what are the pieces that we're kind of missing? So I guess that's a whole lot of questions and a whole lot of processing, but that's where my brain keeps going is, is asking more questions and thinking about where we wanna go as this group develops. And I'll be quiet. <laughs> I guess one of the things that it raises the question for me, Michelle, is, and maybe Kelly can answer this or somebody else has the data. Do we see, um, I think I know the answer, but do, are we seeing racial disparities in um, infant deaths that are related to um, safe sleep? Um, and the work that you were referring to um, with adequate prenatal care, and I really apologize, Kelly is on this and Tawana has helped us and we haven't met in a while, but um, we were looking at the, the difference in uh, who receives adequate prenatal care in Washtenaw County and who doesn't. 
Um, and as probably you all know, adequate prenatal care is the definition that's basically the number of prenatal visits that um, a pregnant person has um, in their uh, pregnancy, during their pregnancy, and depending on when they enter care, it's, it changes a little bit. Um, and given that we have two major health systems in Washtenaw County, it doesn't seem like we know the number has been around 25% up even as much as 30% of women don't receive adequate prenatal care. So we began to look at the data, thanks to Kelly um, helping us with data um, to be able to drill down a little bit more into the data than just what we could get from the state level. And of course, we did see um, a racial disparity, um, geographic disparity, um, and income disparity <clears throat> in who doesn't receive um, adequate prenatal care. Then we did um, a survey of 100 women and we used our trusted parent advisors to go into the community so that we had people, um, kind of community people talking to community people. And we thought we were gonna uncover more about why uh, people didn't continue with prenatal care or didn't start prenatal care. And what we found more was that um, women who, uh, women of color found that prenatal care didn't really, um, wasn't nurturing, didn't really answer their questions and concerns, didn't take their concerns seriously. And the kind of same data that you'll see um, nationally and um, the bias that's uh, has been seen nationally and just it's just reinforcing in the local level. So we're um, continuing, we will be continuing to work, but also the work with um, the Region 9 uh, mom-centered group um, has been really supporting that finding and helping us find ways to impact or um, have, an, have an impact in the healthcare system and those who are providing. So that's why we're really happy to be part of Region 9 and, and with the, um, the doula, uh, community doula work, as well as the trauma-informed toolkits. But Kelly, I'm wondering about the data, if you have that data, or maybe Michelle, you do, or Ashley, about what we see with um, safe sleep or... I'll let Kelly speak to it, but I did ask, uh, I reached out to um, the, uh, oh my gosh, the death review committee, just to see what the data was mm -hmm. for uh, 2021 and they hadn't got it concluded yet. So, um, but I'll let Kelly speak to any other data that she's got right now. Yeah, um, kind of similar to child death review. Um, there's not a whole lot to conclude from 2020 and 2021 data. Um, just a, a kind of generally people of color, um, individuals of color are more likely to suffer from infant mortality in general. I don't necessarily know if they are more affected by infant safe sleep, um, adverse outcomes associated with infant safe sleep. Uh, there haven't very luckily been very many deaths from infant safe sleep in 2020 and 2021. I heard that there may be um, some kind of waiting for review in 2022. Uh, but again, I haven't, given the most recent COVID surge, haven't really had time to, um, to look into those cases yet. I know Angela has a question in the chat about, um, do we wanna to try to talk specifically about which disparities we're discussing? Um, I think that's kind of, it's, it's pretty broad in terms of what we're discussing other than um, ensuring access. And um, one of the thoughts that I've been having is how do we circle this information or this discussion back to safe sleep practices and um, any, um, I don't know, like any 
resources or discussions that are happening around uh, cultural aspects of the delivery of safe sleep, um, that kind of stuff. And Kelly, it will be interesting to see what the analysis is of the last two years years data around infant mortality. That'll be interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for uh, verbalizing my question. So yeah, when we started saying racial disparities, I didn't know if you were talking about morbidity rates, mortality rates, infant, maternal. Um, Certainly safe sleep, I think, sort of akin to what Kelly mentioned, is harder to measure. I mean, what sort of differences, disparate outcomes um, are different racially in terms of safe sleep practice? Because you know, it tends to be a private and not publicly viewable um, human behavior. You, you, know, you, know, you can't always see how people are putting their children to, to sleep. But what we know, so uh, Kelly, weighed in on some of the quantitative data around infant mortality rates, and this is a persistent problem. It's not new, it's been around for a long time. It's not unique to Washtenaw County, unfortunately. This, you know, anywhere from two to three to four times higher infant mortality rates for African-American women, unfortunately, is decades old. Um, but the persistence is more uh, visible now publicly because we're in this age of racial reckoning, as they like to call it, right? I just call it something else, but, um, um, you know, the intensified uh, anti-Black and anti-other BIPOC, other people of color, um, racism that's happening. So it's just more visible because we're focused on it. But um, anecdotally, sort of from the qualitative side of data, we know I mean, there are numerous studies, there, there are countless studies that have collected data and uh, information around the quality. It's not just simplicity of access to care anymore. It's about the quality of the care that obviously many uh, women are uh, securing. The quality of that care um, is not culturally responsive. It is dismissive. It's also, and this is you know, from the data and then also from uh, data we've collected at the community health services with our community health needs assessment, sometimes care looks you know, disrespectful, dismissive, um, certainly not conducive to uh, healthy outcomes, birth outcomes for mother and baby. Um, so you know, now here we are, we land on what, what, what to do about it. We're not talking about people not having access. We, we, we really should be talking about the quality of the care that women are securing for themselves and their children and their families, because we know that women are the gatekeepers of families' health. So, um, you know, some of the suggestions center around training practitioners and, you know, clinicians, pediatricians, prenatal birth workers, et cetera, um, to understand how one uniquely, because equity is different from equality, right? Equality means everybody gets the same. Equity is people get what they need to experience best, best outcomes, to train practitioners and how you operationalize equity. What does that look like? How, how are you individualizing or tailoring the care to meet the needs of your patient or patients? Um, that's one recommendation and certainly the other that um, Helen just spoke to this diversification of the workforce. And like, clearly we know that many of the practitioners don't look like the populations that they're serving. So that's been problematic and explained by many studies and many experts, you know, we don't need to go into that, but um, the significance of that has um, been studied. And there are a couple of studies that were published, I think last year, a national study that found that for ba black babies who were cared for, by a black practitioner, a physician or other, they tended to have better health outcomes, including survival rates. Mortality rates were lower. Um, other health indicators were better. So, I mean, there's a lot to be discussed. I guess the question is how do we as a task force decide that we're going to address it? Maybe, maybe it's in some way that's supportive of a broader initiative like the doula diversification. I would argue I'd like to see that diversification extend to nursing 
in other areas of healthcare, but that's probably a longer, a longer discussion and dialogue. But um, I, I, you know, I've spent years as a child protective services worker. I worked in the juvenile justice system. I've worked for um, welfare reform, the Department of Labor and Economic, used to be called Labor and Economic Growth, it's something else now. So I've seen these sort of infrastructural problems that contribute over time to these outcomes. And, and again, that, that's what makes them long-term because it's not just interpersonal um, level of treatment. It is systemic. It's the way that systems sort of tend to push people through and then how they experience their lives based on that treatment. Um, I don't know. So anyway, I think we have to just pick our poison, you know, pick our poison, you know, choose something measurable, specific, maybe, maybe it's, I don't know, helping to execute the doula diversification. Maybe it's some other area that's proven to be a suggested best practice for addressing some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you said that, Angela, because that's kind of where my brain was going was, you know, where do we, it's such a huge thing, right? Where, what are the things that come back to safe sleep and, and the work that we're trying to do just within this task force that can be impactful? I don't know the answer to that. Um, good comments in the chat here from Kathy. Uh, is it that you read a study or that you're asking us to read one? No, no, I okay. read one. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, it's interesting um, what Angela was saying. Uh, about articulating what behaviors, what what does equity, you know, um, providing fair, equitable, nurturing care look like in terms of training? Uh, there are a lot of areas that where there is not adequate representation, and while that is a goal to be, we need to. There should be and we need to work for it. Um, I think that's, that's kind of a long-term sort of goal. But one of the things that we have um, found in, uh, you know, I, the Sheriff, Sheriff Clayton uh, is an expert in training and um, for law enforcement, but it, it apply, the same sort of things apply and we talk about the same kind of things. Um, when you, you know, what behaviors do or don't result in equitable, warm, you know, nurturing care. And I think that's something that um, maybe this group or, you know, that, because that's a more immediate sort of solution um, that, that I think could be truly impactful. I think it is very possible that some of those caregivers who uh, don't, who who's who provide experiences for people of color that are, are not good don't know that they're doing that. They don't know what things that it, they're saying that um, are off-putting. They don't know what they should be saying or should be doing. You know what? Um, it is very easy to be to say, be nurturing, be equitable, without but without the training for them to know exactly what behaviors, what is being talked about, I think that, it, that um, you're not gonna necessarily get the end results, the outcomes you want. So I really thought that, that was particularly um, important when you said that, Angela. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think, especially when, you know, it's, implicit bias or things that you're not actually conscious about that you're treating um, patients differently based on their race, like not even on purpose. So, you know, what, what is that there? I know, I know there are trainings out there, but um, I wonder what, if those, if that works or how that really like gets down, you know, into people's like, yeah, I don't know if those, those trainings are helpful or know what kinds of things that need to happen for people to recognize that implicit bias and how that impacts the care that they're giving. Um, but yeah, I also agree that this is such a broad topic. How do we 
how do we narrow it down? How do we choose or how do we, you know, pick a direction that's really related to like this task force and this group's um, skill set and what kinds of things like do we want to think of some sort of you know grant to write similar to what Helen's doing but you know not too similar because then it's um, but yeah I just there's a lot to think about for sure and it's hard to narrow it down. I have a question I I heard um, you know doula being referenced a few times um, so a couple of thoughts came to mind are doulas uh, um, approved through Medicaid to be, can you bill through Medicaid for a doula? Okay. So then, um, you know, is there data probably somewhere um, for safe sleep related deaths and income levels or whether, um, you know, they were on Medicaid or not? And is that something, not that diversifying doula um, population or workforce um, wouldn't be helpful in some way, but would that be a focus that we'd want to go in? Well, interestingly <laughs> enough, <laughs> um, April, um, so we applied for funding through the Michigan Health Endowment Fund to expand our program a little bit um, so that we can include services and care from doulas and a dietitian, because we know that there are connections between um, adequate prenatal care, uh, delivery uh, weights of babies uh, when, when they're delivered, uh, low birth weight and infant mortality. So we know that there's a connection there between um, those pieces. So we wrote a grant to see if we could um, ask some of those questions and get some data around if we provide these services and, and target particular populations that can't afford doula care or dietitian care, um, are we able to make a difference? Is there, you know, an opportunity here for that additional uh, support? So. And there is legislation getting yes. pushed through to get um, reimbursements for doula care from a lot of insurances. And it's, it's still kind of like in the process. I think it's probably not super highly prioritized right now um, due to COVID and who knows what. Um, but that is something that is in the works and we're pretty hopeful about that as well. Your, your previous work, Ashley, was as a doula? Is that, mm -hmm. am I, okay. I didn't know if I was making that up in my head. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did work as a doula before. Mm -hmm privately. So um, yeah, what Helen's group is working on and what we're working on, um, they definitely, you know, could work together, but we haven't, I mean, that's not solidified or anything, but yeah, it's when I, I worked as a private doula and some people were able to submit um, to their insurance and get something back. You can pay for doula care out of like an HSA or an FSA, but you know, not everybody has that. So um yeah, that was interesting seeing the like the clientele, the people that were able to, you know, that even thought about getting doula care. It's just not on a lot of people's minds. And so, um, yeah, we're looking to get that, um, raise awareness for that even, and just get the word out and try to get more people that kind of one-on-one -on -one care. Margie, did you want to say something? I saw you unmute yourself. Well, yeah, thanks, Michelle. I, I just wondered um, if I, I seem to remember at a time when I wasn't on the task force that there was an effort to um, go back to um, families who had received um, safe sleep information to check on um, uh, and Michelle's smiling <laughs> um, to check to see whether or not families were um, putting into action that education. But I also wonder if one of the things that could also be an idea is to find out, is to use community input to find out how is the education received by um, women of color? I mean, we're 
or low income women or Arabic women or Hispanic women, you know, just to find out how much we are culturally competent in, in that area. So I don't know if that's a, would re, be more related to safe sleep than actually um, delivery. So I was Michelle, smiling you're, you're because we, at this. Well, I was smiling because we just talked about this yesterday because we're working. Yeah, literally yesterday afternoon. Um, I was asking Ashley, I'm like, okay, so how are the follow up surveys going with the former participants? And she's like, oh, wait. <laughs> Um, so we're, we are, when we're writing our grants and things like that, we're including that as part of the process of people complete the service or, you know, receive the education and the support. And then at three to six months after, are they implementing? If they're not, why not? Are there other resources or questions that they have? You know, are there things that we need to do differently in our education? Is it a cultural competency thing on our end? Is it, you know, what, what is the piece? Yep. Go and ahead. we were also talking about how um, there, there are services out there who provide a pack and play and maybe a sleep sack. And they kind of like, like in the postpartum unit where they kind of like show you the safe sleep information and just have you kind of like look at it and then even maybe sign something acknowledging that you got the information and that like you understand it, but you didn't necessarily go through a training and something that I always try to um, emphasize in my trainings is like, let's stop and talk about like actual scenarios and like kind of get thinking about, you know, what might actually come up in real life when, as you just are kind of, you know, looking at these sheets, you're like, oh yeah, ABCs. Yeah. I know that, but it's not very in-depth. And yet, um, people are yeah walking away either feeling like, oh yes, I understand that. And, or, um, entities are thinking, oh yeah, we gave that information. We, we taught that we educated them. Um, but just not to the same level as going through an entire training and being able to kind of uh, talk through things. So that is something that we were wanting to look into and to you know follow up on that and see if there is a difference in outcomes from people who had uh, who have a full training or who have you know are signing off on something and they they have the safe sleep materials, but do they have the like in depth knowledge of what it actually looks like and what scenarios could realistically come up there? Because it's easy, it's easy to look at it and think, okay, yeah, alone back on the crib, no problem. But something that we talk about almost every training is like, what happens when you fall asleep with the baby? When you fall asleep with the baby in bed because you're exhausted, you're breastfeeding, like, you know, what, like you can, so we talk about, you can set an alarm on your phone. You could have someone sit with you and watch you remove the baby, put them back into their crib. As soon as you wake up, if you did fall asleep and didn't set an alarm or have someone with you, just put the baby right back in the crib. But it, that's not that's something that you don't get to like think through and talk through if you're just kind of like shown information um so all that to say yes we would love to um oh goodbye um yeah we'd love to do some follow-up and see how that the differences in the education being provided affects the outcomes for sure I know we're getting down to the last 10 minutes of our meeting. So what, what other comments or thoughts do you have on this topic particularly? Because I do want to give us some time if anyone has some report outs and to give Carol some time too to talk a little bit about what's happening at the state level. So um, what other things, comments, thoughts do you have about this particular topic? I think we're slowly moving forward or like at least it, even having good discussions is really important. Um, yeah and if anyone thinks of or has any sort of yeah direction for us to move forward and that's I think that's really what we're looking for. Um, of course there's no like one easy answer but if anyone has anything um, kind of sticking out And Angela, I appreciate the comment in the chat about the um, the record decrease black infant mortality rates. Um, I, I think that's amazing. Good on them for, you know, really putting forth some good effort and, and initiatives to help decrease those rates because I know they were exceptionally high. Um, so I'd be interested to hear about what they're doing, what work they're they're providing in the community. No, I just I I just kind of and I know we're short for time, but what I was suggesting is there, 
I don't know that how far we have to look or how, how much additional data. There are models currently in motion that are showing some sort of preliminary success. So we know like, for instance, Detroit's infant mortality rates have dropped, it's, you know, the historical lows and the reproductive care initiatives that are currently underway there. I mean, they clearly did having some impact. And maybe that information is not existent in an article per se. I mean, unfortunately, every successful community intervention doesn't make it into a academic paper, but um, querying, connecting to, talking with those folks who are at the helm of those successful models would be, you know, certainly one way to try to, find, you know, talk sort of informally with people. And I sat on the board of directors for organization in Detroit for some years. Um, you know, building, creating those relationships and building on those relationships to the learn from is one way. I mean, why we create Absolutely. the wheel and talk to people who are already doing it well. Yeah. Something Absolutely. they're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> I think Henry Ford is very much involved in the reproductive care kind of um unit uh, arena there. I mean, I, they, they do have some medical champions who are you know, very much involved. That, that also makes a difference, uh, like a willing clinical kind of, um, I'm not putting Dr. Chang on the spot, but <laughs> willing clinical, um, I don't know, passion, expertise, involvement. That's gonna really, because then, then, then you're, that's your translation. Right, that the people who are involved in they're also um, involved in providing the clinical care. Since you called out my name, yeah, yeah. I, I think part of um, the challenge, and I've mentioned this like a long time ago, probably like a year ago, I mentioned this that you know I think most pediatricians talk a lot about these things, not uh, not the disparity so much. I mean, this is a um, it shouldn't be up and coming, but like a particularly present issue nowadays, right? Um, and so within like Mott Hospital, and I know I see this with my friends across the country, we talk a lot about um, disparities in outcomes and things like that. But when you're talking about like a, uh, like a clinician provider intervention kind of thing, and I'm not sure that's exactly what you meant, but like, I think we spend a lot of time um, providing counseling and anticipatory guidance and um, it's hard to integrate. We don't really know what's evidence-based in terms of being really effective at, at um, changing outcomes. And it's hard to get the individual person in the room to necessarily um, incorporate those strategies that might be a little bit more evidence-based um, because it's just like, you know, we go in and we do our thing and we sort of have a spiel we do, or we're, we're like, we get in, in, a, in a way of practicing that's, which is not to say that we can't change, but it's hard when the data are not so overwhelming and we're not like repeatedly being reminded or trained. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm not being very articulate here. Um, I just think that it's really hard to make that next step, which is probably very, very important. I just don't know how to, how to make that happen effectively and how to know that what you're trying to do turns out to be effective in terms of um, actual outcomes, which is just more questions and not at all a solution, but uh, mm -hmm. just putting it out there as, as uh, like a problem that I see, because, you know, I think a lot of us actually want to do the right thing. We don't know quite how, and uh, yeah. what we do, we don't know if it's actually good or bad. Yeah, yeah. No, it's the macro versus the micro. No, I certainly appreciate your position. Uh, what I meant to say in, in talking about clinical involvement, that they're actually uh, responsible for producing these kind of broader systems level scale interventions. So like they, uh, Henry Ford was instrumental in starting a lactation college to train a more diverse uh, lactation consultants to, because I think the state of Michigan had like well, a couple of years ago, something like six black lactation consultants out of hundreds, right? And, and when women are in their birthing, you know, phase of life, they're oftentimes, you know, they're most vulnerable in wanting to access providers that look like them. 
uh, so the lactation college, and you know, I, I think um, under the direction of Paul, Dr. Shrek was responsible for then like training, mentoring, and um, applying more like you know, diverse workforce of lactation consultants. As an example, I, that's what I, I don't mean like at the micro, it's more this kind of putting in place program initiatives that will have some kind of systems effect. Um, but yeah, it, it's, yeah, there's a lot there. I, I think that that's also really important. I hadn't heard about that lactation consultant at Henry Ford College at uh, Henry Ford. I think that's amazing actually. Um, you know, in medicine, at least, you know, on the medicine part, there are, of course, a lot of other services that can be involved, but on the medicine part, we talk a lot about underrepresented minorities and how we can improve um, the flow through to get people starting at a very young age. And I, I think there are efforts, it's just, they're hard to really get off the ground in a really robust and broad way. Yeah, they take time. They take time. And take time. The pipelines take time. Yes, yes. Yeah, anyway, we probably have not not as much time as we need to really talk as much as we Doesn't need that to. seem to be the case? Every month, I swear, we get to this point, we're like, oh my gosh, we're out of time, and we are just getting into the meat of our discussion. So thank you. I appreciate all these comments and conversation. This is good dialogue. Go ahead, Ashley. I just put an announcement in the thing so that if people need it, they'll, it'll be there. Yeah, um, we're, yeah, we're just about at the end of the time here, but Carol, do you have anything, um, any updates from um, yeah, the State Action Committee? I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, um, our last meeting was in November, actually. I just had to look back and check. I can't remember. It seems like we haven't had a meeting in so long. Um, but we are finishing up our recommendations that we're going to be sending to the state um, I was just looking at like our three main areas that we um, were talking about were education, advocacy, and policy. That's our three main areas of change that we've been looking to make. So everything's going really well. We have a great group and I hope to have more information for at our next meeting for you guys. Thank you so much, Carol. Yeah, and thank you everybody for, um, yeah, for your discussion. We just hit three o'clock. Um, yeah, we can be thinking about what would be the best use of um, our time and our skills as a task force. And um, I, lot like what, I like a lot what you said, Angela, about how there's, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot out there. Maybe we need to be looking into what other um, counties have and cities have been doing and kind of adopt those things and just raise awareness and try to push those policies forward too. Um, so I just, yeah, I really appreciate everybody's um, expertise and input from all different walks of life and experiences professionally and personally. It's, um, yeah, it's really valuable. So um, thank you everybody. I hope, does anyone have anything else to share? Of course, feel free to leave, it's three o'clock. If you have anything else you'd like to share, just want to give people the option. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, we will see you next time. And thank you for those who reached out. Um, I got some emails and some um, messages in the chat. I will send over the um, uh, the template for the letters of support for our Speckered Night ba uh, Safe Baby Program grant. Um, yeah, and I will send out the minutes and whatever other updates and um, yeah, notes from the meeting as well and the reporting. So yeah, thank you everybody. And feel free to email me anytime, anytime you need anything. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Take care. <laughs>